Thank you again for the invitation. It's really nice to be um, a part of this group. I first joined uh, last month's meeting was my first was my first one, but I'm hoping to come to many more um, as new faculty here. Um, yes, yeah, so I'm going to talk to you about um, an area of my research and interest as a speech pathologist and a cognitive uh, neuroscientist. I um, my work focuses on examining the neural correlates of language and communication in patients with left and right hemisphere stroke and also dementia. Um, but I chose this topic today because I think it's one where um, just a little bit more awareness and education could actually really improve patient outcomes. Um, so I hope you find it interesting and, and helpful and happy to answer questions, of course, at the end. Um, but also feel free to interrupt me if, if there's something you want uh, me to elaborate on in the moment. Okay, so this is just a brief outline of what we'll be talking about today, um, looking at an introduction to cognitive communication deficits that are associated with right hemisphere stroke. And then I'm going to go into a bit of a deep dive on apragmatism and the consequences associated with apragmatism in right hemisphere stroke and a spotlight on research in aprosodia, which I will describe all these terms, um, which is a component of apragmatism. And aprosodia is kind of my... Um, my area of expertise within this broader realm, broader realm of um, deficits. And then probably most importantly, what can we actually do to help patients today? So let's dive in. Um, so my other area of research, as I mentioned, focuses on um, aphasia and left hemisphere stroke, as well as in dementia. Um, but when you think, if you are familiar at all with aphasia, um, you know that they can have really significant deficits, especially in a non-fluent aphasia where someone has significant word finding issues, um, very non-fluent, um, their speech is halting, and they have a great difficulty communicating anything in many cases to their um, communication partner. That is in contrast to right hemisphere stroke. So I wanna just show you a very short clip of an actor, Timothy Amundsen, who you may um, have seen in This Is Us and a lot of other shows. He has actually had a right hemisphere stroke and he is now an advocate for raising awareness of how stro stroke can impact you. So uh, just let's just take a quick look. Around here, rapid fire questions. It's called If You Only Knew. Something or someone who inspires you. Some blur. Who's an actress who's been talking a lot about her struggle with MS. She's a single mother who's really hit immense adversity. And she has a very active Instagram account that's really inspiring. So I check that every day to see how she's doing. And... Who's your favorite superhero? I'd say Batman. Me too. Okay, I know I don't have time to show you as long of a clip as I would like, but um, you probably saw that and thought, you know, he's a pretty effective communicator. He's able to clearly uh, portray his message. The his the listener understands and there's, they're going back and forth. Um, but now I want you to look at a clip of him, an interview that he did uh, pre-stroke. Amundsen yep. was born in St. Joseph, Missouri to a railroad worker father and teacher mother. Mm. Come on. Americana. That sounds fake. <laughs> it sounds like some depression era lie. <laughs> we we grew up on ration cards. Did you really? No. Okay, tell me about Missouri. I have no idea. We left when I was one. I don't even know oh, why. Oh, so I nothing. There. Nobody, why is that in there? I don't know. That, I mean okay, so um, you might have noticed that in this interview, pre stroke, um, compared to his post stroke interview, his facial expressions are quite different. Post-stroke, he has very flat affect. He has a more monotone voice. Uh, here, he's leaning in. He's using gestures to indicate uh, that he is engaging with, with the interviewer. He's making great eye contact and joking and laughing. So fundamentally, he does look like a very different communicator here versus um, post-stroke. And you could argue that it might just be that one interview was more formal and this one was more informal. But I picked these clips specifically because they really are representative representative of his communication pre and post stroke um, across multiple contexts and interviews. So um, 
Something, the reason that we talk about uh, in my field that we talk about right hemisphere deficits as being hidden is because compared to something like aphasia, where um, if you walk in to assess a patient, they've just had a left hemisphere stroke, they clearly cannot get any words out, they're going to get an automatic referral to speech pathology. Whereas um, someone communicating like this uh, probably would not get that referral. However, over and over again, we hear from patients and then um, more often their families that they their loved one has fundamentally changed. He's not the husband I married. He's not my dad anymore um, and so on. So we're working to really, and I'm working to really understand what is the nature of these deficits, both behaviorally and uh, neurologically, and then what can we do to support treatment but uh, today, what I, I'm hoping you'll get out of this talk is just referring patients like this to speech pathology can do a great deal of good. Amundsen. So when you think of right hemisphere stroke, I imagine you're familiar with many of the deficits that um, you see in this table that I have um, prepared here. Memory issues, executive functioning with inhibition issues, uh, visual spatial neglect is very common and often is kind of a hallmark symptom of right hemisphere stroke. But what I'm talking about is the cognitive communication deficits. And um, there have been various terms historically to refer to these deficits. I am working with a group of wonderful researchers and colleagues um, that we <laughs> collectively were the International Right Hemisphere Collaborative because uh, we all work on different aspects of right hemisphere stroke. Uh, this is page, um, we span across the US and then we also have two colleagues in Australia. Um, but we are working to change the, the way that we talk about these deficits um, from kind of vague terms to this term apragmatism. And that's because, of course, there's the cognitive deficits associated as well. But when it comes to the communication deficits, what it, they really are rooted in are these pragmatic deficits in different areas. These uh, pragmatic deficits, which we've termed apragmatism, can manifest both expressively with difficulties producing different aspects, um, different pragmatic behaviors, but also understanding them in um, conversation partners. So I do have some examples here, and we've further broken them down into linguistic, extra-linguistic, and paralinguistic. Linguistic refers to deficits in um, contextually selecting appropriate words, syntactic structures, topics, um, and so on. So just some examples here would be giving long tangential answers to questions like, how are you doing? Where the listener is probably expecting a good and instead uh, a right, someone with right hemisphere stroke may ramble on for several minutes. Uh, saying inappropriate things for the context, such as when you have uh, your boss just returned from maternity leave, you would say a patient with right hemisphere stroke may say something like, I don't know why anyone would want a baby probably inappropriate for that context. Receptively would be not understanding what a converse, that a conversational partner is maybe using sarcasm, also difficulty making inferences, such as not understanding that um, a colleague on Zoom might not actually be paying attention to you if a baby just started crying in their background. Extra-linguistic, this refers to the inappropriate use of, um, or comprehension of body language, eye contact, gestures, all those other things that we use to support communication. Um, so this would be manifest as flat affect, flat facial expressions, um, avoiding or using inappropriate eye contact, um, missing cues, you know, your conversational partner gives cues like looking at their watch and kind of looking behind them that they need to go, but being completely unaware that those cues mean anything. Paralinguistic. So this refers to prosody, which is my kind of my area of expertise. Um, prosody refers to the rate, rhythm, uh, changes of to pitch and volume of our speech to convey emotion. And, um, and other things, but the focus in right hemisphere stroke is really on that emotional prosody. This can look like using monotone pitch when you're, the patient is actually extremely angry, but the conversational partner can't really tell because their, uh, their tone of voice is not changing to indicate the level of their anger. 
Also vice versa, where the patient might not understand that someone they're communicating with is happy versus angry. Um, so for example, they wouldn't understand the difference between, I didn't know you would be here. And I didn't know you would be here. Obviously, if you think collectively about all the situations where these types of behaviors could cause communication breakdowns, you could understand why even just having a few of these issues would lead to really far reaching deficits. Um, yes. Um, so yes, this is my little area and I will give you just a brief kind of snapshot on my research in that area. Um, you might be also wondering, well, how common is this? You know, we don't talk about it a lot. Um, there's been some work done in this area. Um, around 96% of adults in an inpatient rehab have at least one cognitive communication deficit. Uh, as far as aprosodia goes, it depends on the um, time post-stroke. At the acute stage, around 70% of individuals appear to have acute aprosodia. And at the chronic stage, estimates vary. But um, these are estimates based off of kind of pretty small samples, really. So there should there a lot more work needs to be done to understand incidence. But we do know that um, in multiple studies, that when you look at the rates of hemispatial visual neglect, <clears throat> excuse me, versus apragmatic deficits, that and in particular prosodic deficits, that aprosodia is far more common than hemispatial neglect, even though that is the hallmark symptom of right hemisphere stroke, or at least one of the hallmark symptoms. <clears throat> The consequences, again, more work needs to be done in this area, but we do know that there are significant changes to quality of life. Um, these deficits are associated with reduced relationship satisfaction and higher rates of divorce, significantly reduced social networks with close friends, extended family, and the community, changes to employment status ranging from just outright being fired because you're rude and not a fun coworker anymore and you're, you're upsetting clientele, to forced early retirement or just demotion. So certainly there are significant consequences. And then just to give a spotlight on some of the research being done in this area, um, and specifically, uh, conveniently, my work in Aprosodia, I am working, and this is work I started in my postdoc with uh, Dr. R.G. Hillis at Johns Hopkins, we are working to develop a cognitive architecture of emotional prosody. Here you can see an example of our three-stage model of receptive emotional prosody with a very similar model uh, for expressive prosody as well. Um, broken it down into three specific stages, all of um, prosody comprehension and then all interacting with domain general emotion, knowledge and processing. We have looked at um, following longitudinal changes by collecting imaging and behavioral data acutely within five days of stroke and then following patients throughout that, throughout that first year of stroke. And all of this work has led us to um, develop this hypothesized model of the um, neural representation of emotional prosody in the brain with a right dominant dorsal stream for the expression of emotional prosody and a right dominant ventral stream for the comprehension of emotional prosody, which is very similar to the left hemisphere model for language processing, if you're familiar at all with that work. So that leads me to um, resources to help patients. What can we do? You know, I uh, a lot of work still needs to be done. This is a really small area of the field of speech um, and hearing sciences. There are not a ton of people doing this work. Um, although the number of people doing it are, it is growing, uh, but currently what can we do? Education is really important. If you tell patients and families to look out for some of these issues and let them know that it's a result of the brain damage, it's not just that their loved one has become, you know, a terrible person or mean, um, like it's rooted in the brain damage is a really important message. Um, also letting them know to look out for these issues so that they can advocate for themselves or maybe advocate for their loved one to get a referral to speech pathology. Um, that would be incredibly helpful. So speech pathologists are trained to assess and treat cognitive communication disorders, but many, many patients are not being referred because these really are, again, hidden deficits. 
they're subtle, they're hard to see in a brief clinic interaction. You know, you're not with them at the restaurant when they're insulting the waitress or um, at work when they uh, leave a room and everyone in the meeting is kind of wondering what just happened because that was such an odd interaction. Uh, so it's, it can be hard to see in a brief clinic uh, setting. So um, one tool I wanted to provide you is the Cognitive Communication Checklist for Acquired Brain Injury. Uh, this is a screening and referral tool. It's you've, I've screenshotted the entire thing here, and you can find it at this link here. Um, it really is just meant to determine if a referral to speech pathology would be potentially beneficial or recommended, and um, it's very short. It is not only for people with right hemisphere stroke, it's also used for traumatic brain injury and other populations, but it's a it's an excellent tool for this purpose. I also, um, there's also a national virtual right hemisphere support group that meets monthly that's led by Dr. Melissa Johnson at um, Nazareth University on the East Coast. This is an excellent resource for patients and families. It can really help them to kind of hear about all the, you know, the varying deficits that can come from right hemisphere stroke and challenges, and then ways that other families have um, found help. There are several, two websites that also collectively um, just have combined and collated a lot of important information and resources that you can share with patients. RightHemisphereStroke.org is an Australian website with lots of great information. And then this is kind of the American version, but they're both, I think, worth um, sharing. And then also, I do have a shameless plug for a colleague who is currently um, conducting a study about referral practices for patients with right hemisphere stroke to speech pathology. And the link for that Qualtrics survey is here. And if possible, perhaps I can send it out um, with uh, just with a bunch of other resources, if that's helpful. And that's it. Thank you so much um, for taking the time to listen to my talk. And I hope I can answer some questions.